This is Ken Forrester, Executive Director at Momenta. Welcome to our Digital Thread Podcast, produced by, for, and about digital industry leaders. In this series of conversations, we capture insights from the best and brightest minds in digital industry. They're executives, entrepreneurs, advisors, and other thought leaders. What they have in common is like our team at Momenta, they are deep industry operators. We hope you find these podcasts informative. And as always, we welcome your comments and suggestions. Good day and welcome to episode 212 of Momenta Digital Thread podcast series. Today, I'm greatly pleased to host Himagari Mukamala, former CEO of Pelion. Hima is currently CEO of a healthcare AI startup in the mental health space. Previously, however, he was CEO of Pelion, enabling customers and partners to securely connect and manage IoT devices over multiple cellular networks globally. He also had a long tenure at General Electric in the industrial IoT and digital space, leading the platform, of course, Predix, engineering and product management organizations. Before that, Hema led various engineering teams at Sybase, building mobile platforms and playing a significant role in the acquisition by SAP. Hema, welcome to our Digital Thread podcast. Ken, thanks for having me. You know, you missed a part about how I've been on a six-month sabbatical after Pelion, and that's been a life changer. <laughs> you know, I wish there were more opportunities. I mean, I'm sure there were more, but I should have taken those opportunities, you know, time to reboot and refresh. You know, the way I think about it, my digital thread was all matted up, and this was a great way to fix it. But, you know, joking aside, uh, good time with family and friends. Today is exactly the end of the sixth month, and that's the time I gave myself. So it's a good start. I'm getting started with this podcast. Excellent. I'm glad you were able to use that for that. And yeah, I didn't mention the sabbatical. Perhaps I'm actually jealous. I did manage once to have the discipline in between two big gigs to take a quote unquote sabbatical. And it literally was probably the one of the most relaxing times. So when I on our, when we put on our exec search hat at Momenta, we often advise people who have just left a you know, longer gig to say, don't push, give yourself three to six months because you will find something, right? And ultimately take the time and enjoy it because it's, uh, it's a bit of a gift the universe gives us, I think, you know, from time to time. So I'm really happy that you did that. And I'm even more pleased that you used our podcast as a way to jump back into the game again here. So you know, we call this the Digital Thread Podcast. And of course, you already started to answer the question, which I think was great. What would you consider to be your digital thread? You know, coming from the industrial world, uh, you know, it's a simple definition for me. If I just look at the industrial side of it, you know, it's all about the data sets that capture the journey of an asset from design to retirement. So if I look at myself as an asset in a cosmic sense, and I'm hoping my digital thread, you know, when analyzed, would show this journey of learning, experimentation, and hopefully improvement. When I look at the face of my leadership during the GE days versus Pelion, you know, I feel like I've changed a lot in how I lead and operate. You know, I've picked roles that help me grow, you know, without thinking about, you know, how much am I managing without consideration of the scope and get into completely new domains and learned a lot. You know, I remember having this conversation with an HR person about a feedback I received about being very unapproachable early in my management career. And it needed a lot of self-analysis to correct those behaviors. So if I sort of correlate with the industrial side, and you know, if the big theme in my digital thread has been enable learning through intelligence based on the data captured. So to net it out, if you look at my journey, you know, we've talked about this. I feel like I've gone backwards in terms of the traditional, you know, what you consider a traditional digital journey, where everyone goes from hardware to software, but I went from a pure software space to industrial, to a company like at the basic physical silicon side, and even to the manufacturing at a short stint at Penguin. So that's how I look at my digital journey, my digital thread, and how I think about that phase. And you've given us several great hooks that we will talk about later, because I think this software to hardware, and conversely, the more difficult hardware to software journey is a, certainly a strong point in what you've been able to show. 
in doing some research for this, I had to really appreciate your byline. So engineer to CEO and everything in between. <laughs> I'd call that an, an app description of probably many of our Digital Thread podcast guests. It's kind of what I like to call the practitioner profile. So your time at GE Digital, I think, is emblematic of this trajectory. So you rose from Senior Director of Software Engineering to SVP of Engineering and Technical Product Management over a five-year tenure. So it was a nice trajectory. GE, of course, in the day was, well, and has been the pioneer of industrial IoT. So Chris, tell us a little bit about your remit there and what you're most proud of. Yeah, no, it was actually going back to that engineer and CEO in between. One of the things I did as an engineer and people look down upon, I shouldn't say look down, but think of building an installer. If you come from the old school ways of building products, you know, the thing you run to install a product on your desktop or server, you know, people thought, ah, that is beneath me as an engineer to write code for that. And that's one of the things I did. And it felt like you should do everything to experience the breadth of what it takes to be a good engineer or a good CEO. And so that's how I thought of that tagline, you know, no job is beneath you. And so that's how I think about how you grow. But going back to GE, you know, my memory of GE, where it started, it was like a short, small group, 50 to 60 of us in the beginning, sitting on just one floor. Right? That's when I started, when the whole notion of GE digital was just 50 to 60 people. I remember the last count when I had left was around 10,000 people, right? That organization growing from that 50 to 60 to 10,000. So it's, it was an incredible journey as far as I am concerned. When I started, and not just started, my remit as I went through five years out there was to build this team and build this industrial IoT platform that was conceptualized and make it into a reality. People who I got to work there, you know, both from the platform side, the predict side, and the business, there's a lot of talent, a lot of experience, and it was so much fun, especially coming from a pure software company like Sybase. So that was very exciting to me. And going back to your other part of what is the most proud of, I think we made what was a new category called industrial IoT. Right? That, was, that is something I'm really proud of. Unfortunately, it didn't manifest into reality at GE in terms of how it got deployed. And there was a lot of factors. Hopefully, we'll touch on that. But having to create that category of a new business and working with the industrial businesses to enable new outcomes, I think that is something I'm super proud of. And also, I was personally at a phase in my journey where I met a lot of new people and the relationships I've built there. And I've hired a lot of them through the rest of my career. So those two, would, I would consider my proudest, you know, memories from that time at GE. It's certainly at the time they were the thought leader, as you say, they really defined this category of uh, industrial IT. I remember uh, some of the early marketing campaigns, i.e. the power of one and two percent, which I thought is still a brilliant exercise in in impact. Right. And uh, and and the impact one can have, even if they save, you know, one to two percent of uh, energy costs and or um, you know, cycle times or things like that. And the other you hit on is outcomes. Right. An outcome based view. Of um, of the solutions you're providing, right? Uh, solution orientation, one might say. So, you know, perhaps as in that journey from you know 50 people up to 10,000 people, however, is a is a reminder of perhaps the danger of moving too fast, at least in the digitization of industry. And so, I'm kind of curious, you know, if you could go back a decade to the start of your tenure at GE, i.e., knowing what you know now, what would you do differently? But <laughs> when I started the next role at ARM, I had a cheat sheet of what not to do. <laughs> um, so there is a theory, right, that first mover advantage doesn't exist when there isn't a true product market fit. And, and although, like you defined, described, we created a category called IIoT, industrial IoT, there were many things that we could have you know, done differently that could have resulted in a different outcome. Although, you know, nothing is guaranteed and there was a lot of variables. But to net out the things I noted down, 
when I started my next job on things I should consider, right? Maybe some of them do differently, some of them, you know, more in terms of my learnings. The first one I really thought through was platforms are hard to build and harder to sell into the market. You've touched on outcomes, you know, without these right use cases, right outcomes, a horizontal platform is very opaque and it gets bloated and it gets bigger because you're trying to support multiple businesses and multiple outcomes and it, and it doesn't support uh, solve one use case to a large extent. So one big lesson I've learned is choose the first outcome, choose the first solution that you want to build and make the platform good at it instead of just building this huge a horizontal technology that can evolve you know, to support multiple outcomes. So that's probably the one big lesson I've learned in terms of thinking more outcome-centric, thinking of one outcome versus supporting multiple of them. The second, maybe more important or equally important is sometimes culture is hard to overcome than technology. You know, I should have spent a lot of time or the digital side should have spent a lot of time understanding how the traditional industrial businesses sell products, work with customers, and how they release products into the market. And it was very different to how we thought software should be released into the market or should help the customers. And so that culture of how traditional industrial businesses think and operate versus how the software businesses should operate. I think merging those two should have been done better from you know my perspective and from the team's perspective. I mean, you've touched on this. We grew too fast from 50 to a huge organization. I mean, we've learned, right, smaller teams make a bigger impact. As there was more visibility, more focus on, you know, because of the marketing, good marketing impact, you know, team became too big and it became harder for us to move and change based on the customer, you know, the business's requirements. So that was a huge operational challenge. And so that's probably the third learning. And maybe tied to this is this notion of increment, incremental build versus a big platform. If you go back and look at this, you know, this huge marketing push we made, you know, it turned out to be this big platform that supports everything. And if I had to redo it, I would think about doing this incremental way of building, like I said, with one outcome. And maybe the final lesson I learned, we can think of software as a very agile, incremental way, but customers don't think that way, right? Customers, the traditional industrial customers have long, uh, have large customers, long life cycles. You know, the industrial assets last for 40 years. So the way they think about software is very different from how we think about software. So finding a way to merge these long life cycles of the assets with short life cycles of the software. And so we would have done, we should have done something differently instead of trying to, instead of confusing the customer base. So maybe those are the five big lessons I've learned, you know, people, culture, technology, and understanding the customer base better. Those are five great learnings and really, are really indicative of the difference, I think, of OT and IT. And, and think of it in terms of general traditional business software being IT and OT being those, you know, those control systems, if you will, and the upper intelligence layers that build out that control. It's interesting because OT will never move as fast and dramatically as IT because it's got a huge amount of, we call it accountability responsibility in terms of these regulated systems and such and long life cycles of the assets that go with it. So it's really apropos, and we could probably do a whole podcast just simply on those five points in there. Knowing the bio up front, I mentioned Pelion, and it may not be clear to the group because you've mentioned ARM several times, that you went on to ARM and you actually took a very ambitious role there, going from general manager of IoT cloud services up to the SVP of the Pelion IoT platform, which you have ultimately become CEO once you spun it out. So, uh, you know, a very ambitious move that ultimately became Pelion. What attracted you to ARM at the time and what were some of your key accomplishments? Just to reflect back on the first topic, we talked about my digital thread, you know, and how I took roles that are not tied to scope or that enabled my learning. 
I actually went from a large organization at GE to just manage a few people because I figured I wanted to step into this aspect of the product life cycle, right? The hardware side of it. And so I stepped down from a size scope and but went to a newer area. And so that's the transition from GE to ARM. The reason why I took it, if I looked at my experiences at GE taught me, it's important to understand the whole product, you know, not just one piece of it, the software. And as I looked at IoT enabling these outcomes, it's very important, especially from a security standpoint, to understand the stack all the way down at the silicon to the software and how this integrated product gets delivered. And then if I looked at the, the two companies in the market that do that were Intel and ARM, but a lot of the sensors and the edge uh, nodes in the market were being built on silicon. And so when ARM reached out to me and said, hey, do you wanna work? I was like, what do you guys do in this space, right? Purely from a uh, cloud and software and services. So when we talked about it, it sounded very interesting and it aligned with how I thought about products should evolve. And so this notion of an integrated hardware software stack being essential from an IoT space and um, no better place than ARM, that's what made me go to ARM. Again, I chose roles that were, had to be very different. You know, GE was a very different organization. GE sold through these industrial businesses with long attach rates with customers, you know, who the sales team have been working for a long time. If you know ARM, ARM doesn't have a direct sales team. All they're selling is through the ecosystem and the partnerships, right, through companies like Silicon Labs that license their technology and sell it to their end customers. So ARM doesn't do any manufacturing. So that's something that attracted me in terms of learning new things. And also the people side of it, you know, Simon Seegers, who was CEO of ARM, and Dipesh, who was a CTO, they were very different leaders, you know, coming from a hierarchical organization like GE, they were very hands-on, very approachable. And so that's the other thing that attracted a lot from how it was different from GE. And so that's something that I liked, and so I went there. So it was an interesting, again, five years. And for me, two years is never a good time to make an impact. And so I stayed there for five years. And it was quite the experience because, and we might touch more about this later, going to a hardware company and trying to make that team operate like a software company. I mean, for me, if I am proud of something, that is the biggest thing I'm proud of because hardware has to be 100% perfect, right? No defects but the software doesn't evolve that way. And so trying to change the mindset of the organization, I think that was something that I'm incredibly proud of, not just me, but the whole team. Yeah, it's quite an accomplishment and certainly on a huge platform of ARM, but also of uh, Pelion. So you presided over the spin out and ultimate trade sale of Pelion. We have both very defining achievements. What did you learn from this time, both about the IoT connectivity space and this spin out sale process? I think the, one of the biggest lessons and maybe one of the biggest things I was proud about was three of the top five industrial companies. We brought them as customers to Pillion when we were inside ARM. But then the challenge was, how do you make sure going back to this theme of industrial companies, once they are a customer, they have long cycles. And so you have to make sure you support them through their journey, right? The 20 year cycle and the 40 year cycle. So when it came the time for spinning out Pillion from ARM, my biggest challenge was how do you take these industrial contracts, right? Contracts with industrial customers and ensure there is continuity, both from a support side, technology side, and from a people side, as we go through this process of spinning out. Just as a background, we were, a business unit within ARM, and through the SoftBank and ARM um, process, we were spun out as a separate company, which I continued to run as a CEO. Like any other spin out, any other acquisition, you think it takes X time. The reality is it'll take at least 2X to 3X. You know, I've seen that happen multiple times. And so one of my biggest lessons was 
As an engineer, we are told we always buffer up time. I know as a CEO, you should do that more, <laughs> especially when you go through this acquisition process. As a big company, we had a complicated legal entity structure, right? Companies or companies and so on. And so trying to unravel all of that and simplify it to a small business, right? Because at the end of the day, Pillion became a small company. And so that was a big challenge. And I think there's a lot of new age companies where you don't need to set up your own legal entity to hire people in different regions. So at that time when we started, you know, we didn't have that luxury, but hopefully, you know, that doesn't become a challenge now. What else did I learn? Try to get a higher enterprise value as the buyer, you know, will find ways to discount from the initial term sheet to the due diligence. There will be some gaps in what you provide. And so always shoot for the highest enterprise value in the beginning, assuming the eventual value you're going to get is going to be discounted. <laughs> so that's something which I've learned through that process, purely from a process and evaluation standpoint. But from a pure technology standpoint, I think the market that we were in, this whole IoT connectivity space, it's just getting started, right? A predicts around a trillion connected devices by 2035, and we are at 2023. And I think this market of, you know, where you talk a lot about this edge devices and sensor devices, I think that market is just getting started. So I'm still very bullish about it. And I'm still looking at a lot more of these devices to come online and collect the data so that, you know, you can run AI workloads at the edge like a lot of your companies do, your investments do. Yeah, yeah. And uh, adding low power wide area like LoRa, Sigfox, et cetera, in, into the mix, you know, to help with those as well. So it's become much more of a diverse, if you will, landscape in terms of edge communications. But agree with you, we're still scratching the surface on on what that looks like. I want to go back to a um, question you've asked a couple of times and you, you and I discussed at length before the call. And that really is this idea of where companies trying to create software capabilities. And I know you've got a long experience base and some passion. So I was hoping you could say more about uh, one, your own experience, but two, you know, wh what have you seen in terms of success patterns there? You know, I wish I had a silver bullet for every company that wanted to do this. Fundamentally, what any of these companies that are trying to be add software, they need to have a clear product strategy, right? So there's always a confusion of, are we adding a new product within the same company? Are we just enabling more hardware sales? Or is it a combination? Because that clear strategy is what enables a hardware company to become successful. And a lot of times, there isn't that clarity to start with. And I'm not saying you should stick with what you start with, but at least the steps you take have to be driven by the good first decision on what role does software play in the future of your company, right? So that's one thing I think should be clear from the get-go. And that will enable a lot of downstream decisions in terms of pricing, in terms of go-to-market and so on. Uh, and so that is an important decision. The second thing that I've seen that companies can do earlier is a clear organizational strategy. Like I've said, cultures uh, are harder to overcome than technology, and a lot of the culture is in the organization. And so trying to structure the organization aligned with the strategy so that whether it's an integrated product offering or a pure software and a pure hardware, whichever the strategy might be, an organization that aligns with it, I think is one other key sort of a decision that needs to be made when companies think about driving towards new software offerings, integrated or otherwise. Maybe the third thing is build versus buy decisions. You know, I've seen a lot of hardware companies who, you know, have traditionally built a lot because hardware, you end up building a lot of stuff on your own, trying to build software too. If you come from a traditional software space, you tend to go with the mindset that there's enough of open source in the market. I'm going to just pull along and only build what's needed. So this early decision on build versus buy 
And that also comes from the right talent, you know, having the right talent in the organization that can think that way. And so that's probably the third one, you know, build versus buy decisions. The probably the fourth one that I can think of is merging of these product life cycles, right? We talked about it in the GE, long hardware cycles versus short software cycles. It creates friction in the organization. So having the clarity and talking about it within the organization and having a release cadence that bridges these two, I know that's very critical in succeeding in this transition, in this digital transformation for a hardware company. And finally, you know, we talked about it in the beginning, right? The solution centric versus the platform centric. I strongly believe, you know, solution centricity helps the hardware companies get closer to the customer and make their software better aligned with how the company delivers capabilities into the market. So those are probably the five, six things I think of, you know, when I think of key parameters from a evolution into a, you know, a merged hardware software company. Well, and, and certainly speaking from a deep experience, because you've been through this cycle a, a number of times, I'm kind of curious. So industrial automation is at an important crossroads given reshoring, the energy transition, labor challenges. What are some of the key trends that you're watching relative to the future of industry these days? You know, you and I have been in this space for so long, and, and I think it's a great time to be in the industrial automation, you know, especially in U.S., with all the reshoring effects, the CHIPS Act, and the manufacturing stuff being broad. And, and although I've read this just yesterday, that TSMC has pushed out its plant in Arizona from 2024 to 2025 because of labor shortage. So, I mean, it's a good time to be in this space. Labor is a premium. Talent is a premium. And so, so that's something I'm really keen on and interested one of the key trends I'm seeing is leveraging AI in mitigating some of the labor shortages. But I honestly feel like one of the things that is underrated and has gotten lost a little bit in the midst of this generative AI mania is computer vision. I feel like, and it's also AI, but may not be generative AI sort of a paradigm. But in the industrial automation, especially in quality and safety, it plays such a big role. And especially automating the manufacturing sites and using vision to do that, I feel like, uh, and given the labor shortage problems. And so I think computer vision is going to just get bigger and bigger, especially using edge sensors to capture the data, visual data through the manufacturing lines. So that's one key thing as that I see as a trend emerging. The second one, as I, you know, that I'm passionate about, you and your team are passionate about is edge and sensors, you know, whichever terminology you may use, small sensors, big sensors, light edge, small, big edge, small edge, ultimately collecting data and analyzing it, it's going to become a big differentiator in this space, in industrial automation, not just where in the manufacturing side of the life cycle, but also where the assets are deployed in the field, right? So that's a trend that, you know, we've seen over the last 10 years, but given the growth in these sensors to run AI workloads, I think, and also the growth in connectivity like you talked about, and the diverse set of connectivity available, I think it's going to become a big differentiator. And then finally, on the theme of connectivity, Without all of these data sets being sent to either the local sensors or to the edge gateways or to the cloud, without connectivity, nothing can be materialized. And I see that diverse connectivity options continue to proliferate. And one of the things I'm seeing is emergence of private LTE, secure, high volume. And so that's one other trend that I see that we were also looking at when we were at Pillion. But I look at these four trends, AI, vision, edge and sensor data to stream that data so that analysis can be done. And then finally, a good connectivity backbone that enables this data movement. That's what I see as emerging trends or maybe continuing trends that are going to be solidified in this space. 
I think you've just described probably a good third of our portfolio and probably some of where we're making the most investments these days, especially the computer vision. And so um, it's nice to have that reinforcement. So I know when you're not leading industrial impact, you are actually running mountain ultra marathons. So I understand these to be somewhere between 150 mile plus, some over 200 mile races, such great locations, Tahoe, Bigfoot, Moab. Tell us a bit about this passion. <laughs> that also needs one complete podcast. <laughs> we <should talk. laughs> um, yeah, on running techniques, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Simon Seegers, who's a CEO of Arm, left a note on my LinkedIn post when I said I was taking a sabbatical. He left a post about my stamina and persistence. And I can attribute those two characteristics to this passion. Ultra running has taught me that you know, journey is what matters. If you look at these long races that you've described, there are eventual highs in spite of these long lows that you might go through, but you just have to wait for them, right? Our career journeys are very similar. You have to have this sense of optimism and happiness. And you get, if you don't have those when you're running through a race that takes goes over 240 miles, four to five days, you will never try these races and you will never enjoy these races. And so for me, that passion has taught me those characteristics that I brought back, that I take back into real life whenever I can. And then the other thing, you know, I've just come back from Colorado where I helped a few of my friends run a couple of these long races. And the other thing that this passion of mine brings me is a sense of teamwork and sheer success. I was there for their race. I was not even running a race. And sometimes, you know, the happiness comes from success, which is not even your success, right? They finishing their races or they giving their all for the race. And so uh, this is what this passion of brings to me and, and uh, you know, something that gives me that ability to come to go to work and think of shared success and team success. Awesome. Well said. And uh, it's uh, great to see the physical and personal manifestations make the professional. I agree with you. There's a, probably a lot of similarities in the character, perseverance, stamina, cadence, all of those things you learn from uh, long distance running or any sport. So in closing, I always like to ask, where do you find your personal inspiration? Of course, beyond running uh, mounts and ultra marathons. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I listen to a lot of podcasts and there's a few books that I feel like have fundamentally changed my outlook on life. One of the first books that I read, maybe when I was into my early 30s, The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. It was a great refresher in enabling me to sort of rethink about life, passions, and what matters in life. It's a book by Robin Sharma. The second book I feel like that has changed how I do stuff. It's a book by Sakyong Mifam, if I remember right. The name of the book is Running with the Mind of Meditation. Now, I was one of those people who was like, ah, meditation is not for me. You sit in a place and you try to do, and it's hard to do. But once I read that book, it changed my outlook about how you can meditate when you run, when you do whatever you're doing. It's about just being present wherever you are and focusing on life where you are. And so that's a book that you know really changed how I think about life and, and breathing and just a positive outlook on life. Maybe the last thing is probably more familiar to people, uh, this book about grit, power of passion and perseverance. I think it's by Angela Duckworth. It talks a lot about how effort will count more towards outcome than just pure raw talent. And there is this equation where she talks about uh, the effort you make plus the persistence and the talent. That's what differentiates you. And so it's a great book on how you continue and it fits into how I run my races. And so that those probably are the key ones that I feel like have impacted along with all the professional podcasts that I listen to. Great recommendations. I did read The uh, Monk Who Sold His Ferrari uh, several years back and enjoyed it. The Running with the Mind of Meditation, that one I'm going to have to definitely uh, take a look at. It reminds me of uh, Eckhart Tolle's The Power of Now, at least the way you've described it. So uh, 
which is also a read that uh, I think one of our other podcast guests recommended. So, and uh, and of course, uh, grit. So it sounds like great reading material. So, Hema, thank you for sharing this time and insights with us today. No, thank you so much. You know, f- for all the people you bring on here and enabling us to learn from their experiences. You know, shared experiences are what makes us human. And and I'm so glad you are doing this consistently week over week or two weeks over two weeks. And and that requires a lot of passion and persistence. So thank you. Well, I really appreciate the mention uh, in that. It is an effort of love. I just really appreciate smart people and those, you know, that operate in the same space that I've come to love over, you know, 40 years of my own career. And you clearly are, um, have been a leader in that. And so I look forward to next big things that you're going to be accomplishing, given that you've had such a great track record and a great running technique and pace in doing so. So this has been Hema Gary Mukamala, former CEO of Pelion and a mountain ultra marathon runner. Thank you for listening. And please join us for the next episode of our Digital Thread podcast series. We wish you a momentous day. You've been listening to the Momenta Digital Thread podcast series. We hope you've enjoyed the discussion. And as always, we welcome your comments and suggestions. Please check our website at momenta.one for archive versions of podcasts, as well as resources to help with your digital industry journey. Thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.